Welcome, one and all, to the mystical world of Felbar. Adventures abound throughout this realm, and we appreciate the opportunity to regale you with some stories from these trails. These accounts are all based on actual RPG experiences that occurred within Adventures in Felbar. Some of these tales may be for mature audiences, while others may be for very immature audiences. We now present the sage Mikas Tumo from Tamel, also known as the Bard of Felbar. Welcome to session Fartook-84. The previous episode showed us that a group of Grey Cloaks had entered Tunis and nearly trampled Karina. When the group discovered their presence, they found it to be too much of a coincidence with the pressure of their wanted poster. When they went to investigate, they found that the Cloaks had taken Cabe and Tressa Norink hostage and imprisoned the City Watch. A quick battle ensued with Bolger the Sailor using a deceptive technique to gain the upper hand. With the Grey Cloaks in custody, the Watch Commander and Adventurers struggled to come up with an equitable resolution. Karina has come up with a plan as she describes it as a great idea, which is where we rejoin our heroes. The party, along with Tressa Norink and some of her guards, stood in the cramped quarters of the stone building. The Grey Cloaks had been stripped of their armor and weapons and been bound only with their cloaks protecting their modesty. I like this plan, nodded Cabe Silvertongue. It shows... panache. Karina nodded and smugly smiled at the compliment. Which one first, muttered Tressa. The bard immediately pointed at the man who had punched him earlier, stating that he needed to go first. Fargus, and a guard of equal to his size, grabbed the Grey Cloak leader roughly and plopped him into the large cast. The Grey Cloak's dark eyes glared at Cabe, and he spoke in a deep, angry tone. No matter how long it takes, half-breed, I will find you, and I will kill you. The half-elf half fluttered his eyes and whispered, I have nothing for you, but I'll miss you. Karina smacked the man on the back of the head and told him to scrunch down or risk losing the top of it. Squirming his way down, the large man was able to dip his head down below the rim. Lady Irena stepped up and rapped on the barrel three times. A bright light flashed and the man was gone. Next! held out Bolger, and one by one each of the gray cloaks were deposited in the barrel, wrapped only in their cloaks. As the fifth man disappeared, the group gave a hearty laugh and congratulated the waif on her creative solution to the problem. Tressa ordered the guards back to their duties and stood with the party. What about their horses? she inquired. The group looked to each other and asked Karina if she wanted to switch out peepers, but she stated that she was quite content with her exotic mount. Sister Elaine advised that the guards could use them on their forays outside the wall as the party had no use for them. The watch commander thanked them and they all began to depart the building when a flash of light bathed the chamber again. Puzzled, Cabe went over and looked inside the barrel. He pulled forth a jingling bag of coins and a note. Tossing the bag to Bulger, the bard read the note out loud. To the party of six, we appreciate your deposit and have moved your goods to a suitable location. Please note that one of the items came with a reward. Sir Maggart has been found to be in demand elsewhere. The reward is yours with the thanks from Haggard Toulouse. The group was equally puzzled and Bulger opened the bag. A sharp whistle caught the attention of everyone and he spilled forth the contents. Platinum ingots. Platinum? questioned Sister Elaine. This guy must have been a handful. The group surmised that Maggart was most likely the leader as he was the biggest ass of the group. Tressa leaned in and did a quick count. That's probably a thousand gold pieces worth of platinum right there. Try not to spend it all at once, she mused. The group discussed their newfound fortune and opted to bank it, but taking out 200 gold pieces out as additional spending money. Another missive was created and the money sent out. The receipt returned and the group left back towards the feathered pig. Upon their arrival, the group and guard commander selected a table in a secluded corner of the establishment and ordered beverages. A pall had fallen over each of them as they pondered the events of the last hour. Tressa broke the silence as the drinks arrived, stating, You know more will come. Each delver shook their heads in agreement as they sipped on their drinks, considering what to do next. 
Maybe Dingus has almost gotten the issue resolved and our names will be cleared soon. The group looked at the waif and she could see in their eyes that her hopes didn't appear to be credible and she shrank back glumly drinking. The commander cleared her throat and appeared to want to say something. Fargus and the others noticed her hesitation and told her to speak her mind. Her apprehension was palpable and the group waited patiently as she carefully worded her response. <sighs> okay, so the syndicate is out to get you, but it is the Phoenix chapter of the syndicate. The group nodded and appeared nonplussed at the revelation before the woman continued. All of the syndicates run themselves, but they all answer to a single leader. Each syndicate leader still has to answer to one individual, and that is Pole to Pot. It may be a long shot, but perhaps you could speak with her. The group looked at each other with a high amount of skepticism, causing Sister Elaine to speak up. <clears throat> Let me get this straight. You want us to contact Paul Depot, the overall leader of the syndicate, to plead our case? That's your plan. The others looked away from the cleric and back to Tressa for confirmation. Her curt response was rapid. Of course, when you say it that way, it sounds stupid. The others began to argue vehemently about walking into the jaws of the criminal element that has a price on their heads, and it was clear to all that the idea was foolish at best and lethal at worst. Tressa attempted to defend her position, but soon realized that it was futile to argue the merits of that idea further. Bulger spoke up and asked if maybe this Hagrid Toulouse could assist them. Silence fell over the table as each person pondered that suggestion. The former sailor continued and pointed out that if he was willing to openly pay for a member of the Grey Cloaks, he was certainly in a position of power, or at least feared very little. He countered that perhaps this benign individual may have had other thoughts on their options. Looking around, the squat gnome noticed everyone was formulating opinions, but no one spoke up. Quaffing his beverage quickly, he wiped the foam off his face with the back of his hand and smacked the table. Well. How do we go about finding this guy? The group looked at Tressa, who shrugged her shoulders. Karina blurted out, Let's put a note in the coffer. Maybe the wizards will tell us. With no other venues available, the group conceded that it was a sound plan, but several grumbling bellies at the table indicated that they might need to eat first. The late lunch was ordered and the group shared jokes and stories until they finished and headed off to write the missive into the great beyond. We close out this episode now and give you our thanks for listening. Please subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at The Bards Podcast. For everyone in Adventures of Philbar, thanks for listening.